Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Dan Q. Makalua. The Me and Team. Mad Jin. With guest co host, Kamikaze. Early Survive Vanilla when most of the achievements were unlockable by the AI. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, you know what was also good for some of those uh, early achievements? Advanced starts. Uh, I found a use for advanced starts. Yeah, when, just when like... Dan's warming up to advanced starts, what is this? Bad, Dan. Bad. No, that just shows you that anything is possible if I can warm up to advanced starts. You have to spend your points wisely. Welcome to episode 187. Here today, our regular co-hosts, Dan Q. A podcast of 1,000 minus 813 episodes begins with the first word. Makalua. I don't know what to make of what Dan's saying sometimes. <laughs> the Mean Team. The Mean Team Plus is different from Google Plus. <clears throat> 100% more trolling. I assure you. And imagine. Uh, sorry. Uh, it's going to be one of those days. <laughs> There's a map pack, and it's scrambled. It's a scrambled nation's map pack. The whole issue of the price point came up again. Gee, I wonder why. <sighs> I think it's a fair enough comment, really. I mean, I think in Australia it's $8 or something for each of scrambled nations and scrambled continents. So, Of course, as pointed out in the thread on CFC about this, just wait for a sale. And it actually reminds me of if anyone has ever seen The Teaching Company, it's at greatcourses.com. They have audio and video of a number of academic subjects, and they typically have a sale going on at any point in time with like 70% off or more. And these are courses that are typically like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So you just wait for a sale. Now, I realize that's a much greater scale. I mean, so we'll go from, you know, $4.99 in a Steam sale to $2. Now, someone, KPI not key performance index because it's not capitalized. It's just lowercase KPI. Uh, It's not sure why they would charge monies for maps. They should be free. hmm. I like free things too. We all like free things too. Although, I mean, if everything was free, we would probably run out of free for a while because there are bills to pay and people typically don't like IOUs. Yeah. To receive them. I mean, to give them. I mean, obviously. There was a theory (laughs) going on in the thread that they kicked these maps out during uh, Brave New World production and we're just selling them separately now. But in the Scrambled Continents thread, which was for the DLC back a couple of weeks before, Syrian popped his head in to say he wasn't actually available during Brave New World production. So he did actually get commissioned to create these separately. I'm actually surprised the conspiracy theorists didn't say these have been sitting around since vanilla. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, there was one person, uh, Mudrak, who went on a rant upon the rant. He's like, I still don't understand why people are complaining so much about these DLCs. The changes to mechanics, new mechanics, and some nice chunk of content has been added through patches for free or through expansion packs. Nobody is forcing you to buy these DLCs. They don't add anything new in terms of mechanics, so why bother so much? Only if you're a completionist like me, you will get these DLCs, but even then, why not simply wait for a price drop and then get it? Like Cleric had said in response, I I like his response, even though I don't agree with all of it. I would not call a patch giving when it is done to fix flaws in a product. That's a company's job, and there are still many issues with Brave New World and the AI, both mechanically and balance-wise, that have not been addressed. I really don't appreciate being told I should be happy or appreciate anything. I already gave my $100 plus of appreciation. Mm. (laughs) Ooh, sassy. But beyond questions about price, uh, and this is actually something that I hadn't thought of, uh, either for this uh, map pack or the one uh, a little earlier that uh, Kamikaze mentioned, do any of the maps include rap? If not, no way in heck would I ever buy it or even play it for free. Oh, sting. I hate maps that don't wrap around. I don't think they do. I don't even think that's an option. If that's your deciding point, well, that's okay. That's for you. But I think that's pretty... Petty is too strong. It's 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 such a minute detail that I, I really don't think it's that substantial. It must make a difference to me. I'm used to them not rapping already. But what's the point of playing the game if you can't circumnavigate the globe? Exactly. You circumnavigate the Pangea, duh. That's mm. not circumnavigation the same way. Circumcontinentation? That sounds awesome. We should go with <laughs> circumcontinentation. I do agree with Sirocco 16V, though, because, again... 
2K, if you're going to sell a map pack, could you post a screenshot of every single one? Oh. Is that really so hard? Yeah, that would be nice. Thanks. Sometimes. Maybe 2K went, hey, we didn't do that the first time. Yeah, but somebody community did it for free. Oh, okay, they'll do it again. <laughs> they'll help us sell it for us. We don't have to pay them anything. Mm. I guess it's kind of giving away the game that if you've seen one, you've seen them all. I mean, they're showing the random features, but it's kind of admitting the fact that they're all just the same type of map. Random features inside with a different exterior. I'm a statue, says in the chat, buy a movie ticket and popcorn for uh, 10 to $15 for a two-hour value, or buy a map pack for 10 to 20 hours value or more. Choices. Oh, well, yeah, that's that's the thing. You You have the choice if and when to buy it, and that's that. And by the way, Christmas is coming up. So if you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever it happens to be, if you're giving presents at the end of the year or you've got a birthday coming up, if you have a birthday coming up in the next year, <laughs> you could add that to your wish list. So then you don't have to buy it at all. You can ask somebody to spend their own money on it. Yes. Yeah, see, weirdly, if I was going to ask for something for a birthday, it wouldn't be this DLC. <laughs> <laughs> something a little bigger... Yeah, what DLC would it be, imagine? Uh, I don't know. Enemy Within. You already have that. <laughs> According to Crow Magnus, which... Why do I think of the television series Sliders when I hear that? I'm such a geek. Uh, yes, you are. Caravans greater than a great library, and they even expressed it with the greater than symbol, because math is math. Yeah, I said that. In preface, he says, it doesn't matter that you can't get the great library on Deity. And yes, we are talking about Civilization V. You wouldn't want it anyway. The great library is awesome at Emperor or Below, and okay at Immortal, but not really all that great on Deity since Brave New World came out. And the good news is, on Emperor Below, you can get the great library if you only go for it when the conditions are right. His introduction, he does go into some math, and yes, the math is questioned. I let someone else question the math, either by quoting the person who says it in the thread or paraphrase it or whatever otherwise. The Great Library costs 185 hammers on standard. It yields one free tech, three beakers a turn, one great scientist point a turn, two great works of writing slots, and a maintenance-free library. Yes, true. In the best case scenario, you research calendar when building the Great Library, and you use the free tech to open philosophy, 175 beakers, the most expensive tech you could realistically get so early. So the Great Library yields, at most, 175 beakers, plus three beakers a turn, and it costs 185 hammers. What else could you get for 185 hammers so early in the tech tree? Answer, two caravans, 155 hammers total. Two caravans on deity yield, on average, plus four beakers a turn for eight in the early game and a whole lot of gold. At eight beakers per turn, two caravans yield more tech after 40 turns than the Great Library. Caravans start to diminish in tech yield over time, but the impact of three beakers a turn is negligible by the time caravans peter out. And this assumes you focus on tech. Yeah, it's just... The Great Library is one of those nice hammer soaks that can get you to philosophy way faster and therefore if you could get it you get international college up faster etc etc somebody somewhere in the thread mentioned that uh, it's potential that building the great library and then the national college sinks way too many hammers in and you're not uh, getting granaries and other such things working therefore basically you'll have your great library and national college but not necessarily have much of an empire and that i definitely agree with at least that line of thinking is a good line of thinking on it but just comparing beakers to beakers doesn't really talk about the opportunity costs and not to mention he says for deity the worker steel must be early to get the great library but deity you don't build the great library because it's always being built i mean yes there are certain civs that and certain start positions that really help to get it because you get extra production and extra food blah 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 egypt no it's not even just egypt like there's that was an example yeah but realistically it's not a great hammer shink in the early game on deity anyways plus it's a high chance of the ai getting it so Meh. And if you needed yet another reason, think, oh, well, if I don't get it, then I'll get the fail gold. Well, yeah, fail gold is fail. Yeah, fail gold is fail. But yes, caravans on DD in the early game are pretty solid. But As long as you're able to protect them. Yeah. And also as long as there's cities nearby that you can actually trade with. And those are nice, but I still prefer the uh, cargo ship food, even to uh, the just pure raw beakers that you get out of a caravan route. I'm assuming that caravans and cargo ships he's considering as, you know, interrelated. Not that, you know, a caravan itself is the good thing and 
the cargo ship is not or something weird. But otherwise, yeah, the food out of the cargo ship trader for uh, sending it back to your capital will mean you're going to grow way faster and be able to produce way more earlier than if you sent it over to somebody else for a tiny amount of gold. And it is a very decent amount of beakers, at least at that point in the game. Food from the cargo ship is worth more than the Hagen Gardens. Yeah, it's better than a wonder. I mean, the great scientist point per turn is good, especially if you can uh, double up on the uh, Oracle. If you go for both Great Library and Oracle, then you can get your first Academy down really early in the game. And then it has even more impact, because you'll have two of them. Therefore, the uh, Beaker calculations are a little off, because you would have done that anyways. And Dao in the thread does also talk about, specifically, extension of what Majin is saying, internal food routes and international incoming trade routes, that this offsets the value of the beakers per turn from your own trade routes, as well as increase the value of a jump tech bonus to get either a clutch wonder or an early national college. Long story short, Great Library provides something nothing else does. The real relevant thing is whether it's worth going writing as the second to fourth tech, and it really isn't anymore if you have a nearby AI to trade with. Uh, I don't know about that very last part of that last sentence, but I'm otherwise on board with what he's saying. It depends on what you're doing. I mean, if you're going speed tradition and you go for the extra food first and then the extra wonder production, blah, 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 and you can manage to get an extra settler out to feed your capital, then great library. Although on deity, it'll be gone well before you can get that all set up, but... (sighs) It kind of has to be a deity specific thing, really, because if you're playing on a lower difficulty level, like king or below, then um, you're only going to get one or two beakers max from those trade routes early in the game. And that's only because the AI is pursuing different techs. Um, you've got some gold, but that's the only benefit you're getting from caravans early on. That's yeah. a pretty small benefit. Korg Magnus apparently has been going on with the Shoshone and building up saves for uh, getting the Great Library start. Made that he's getting to architecture first without the Great Library more than once. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But uh, it's a question of did he steal any tax? Um, what was he going for? What was he doing? Yeah. What was his relationship like with other AI? Did research agreements come into play. Yada yada yada. Uh, that stuff he doesn't really talk about. Or the quality of the trade routes. If you can get a trade route to somebody who's going to give you 10, 15 gold per turn early in the game, that's worth a lot of stuff because you can buy those buildings with that money. Yes, that's right, as opposed to building them, that's true. No. Yes, on DD, don't go for the Great Library. Why? Because you're unlikely to get it. And if you're constantly reloading until the point where you get it, then you're not really playing DD. But um bum. So here's a question from Reddit. Dan's on Reddit. It's weird. It's not like you have an internal injury. Yeah. <laughs> so the question comes up from uh, Velkaruk. Do you think for a while before making a move? His answer, of course, is he doesn't since he civ in the moment. General concept here is most people basically don't think is their answers. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking is for real life, not gaming. What's up with that? Yeah. That's pretty true. I think gaming is really the thing you do when you don't want to think. Well, I mean, for a lot of the times, especially in Civ, you have targets for what you want to do, especially on the tech tree. So you want to do this, this, or this, or you want the game to turn out in a certain way. So you want to go do this, certain things. But yeah, it's like, do you stop and think before you do something? If you played enough Civ and you're sufficiently deep in it, then a lot of times it's just, it'll be reactionary. Like you already know what's going on and you already know what to do without having to stop and think about it. But, yeah, you should stop and think sometimes. <laughs> it is a strategy it's... game, and yeah. a lot of success in every Civ title has been playing around what gives you the most yield <laughs> or has the least opportunity cost or whatever, or is best against its opportunity cost. And that means you have to stop and consider it unless you already know the answer or you just don't care about playing it effectively. Yeah. I mean, if you already know the answer to the whole game, then why are you playing it? Well, you do go through the motions at that point. Well, yeah, but that's an individual game. But if you know from the beginning and you're not even thinking from the beginning of the game, oh. like, what are you doing? What do you think? This is Call of Duty? Man, I hate that analogy. Call of Duty is more of a movie experience. <laughs> it's certainly not a strategy. <laughs> well, you don't have to think. 
You well, that's not true though. If you actually want to be decent, you do. But the problem is the game equalizes that away. This is not a Call of Duty podcast. Aww. I have a reasonable experience with the series, and I'm pretty good at it. But there are some very frustrating things in that game. And whatever criticisms I've levied on Civ Five are nothing compared to that series. Well, what about you, Mackie? In Civ, do you think a long time about what it is that you're doing before you do it? Well, not in multiplayer, that's for sure. I don't have time to think. <laughs> that's interesting. I was actually going to bring up the difference between how we answer this question, if it's single player or multiplayer. You might have to not worry about playing multiplayer very often if you take too long before making a move because no one will want to play with you. Unless there's a timer. And then you're just a target. <laughs> Double moved. No, you know, honestly, not for Civ. I, I spend a lot more with, in EU4 with it sitting on pause going, okay, do I really want to attack this person with all their friends? I don't know. I think a factor in this equation is also how familiar you are with the series to this point. Yeah. I know every Civ game, it, it changes. It's also how familiar you are with the series and how often do you play a particular game is going to determine how long you think, in part. Yeah, well, it has to. I mean, the more you know about something, the less you have to directly, well, consciously think about it. You're always subconsciously thinking about it if you're playing it. Uh, and your buddy and mind will just go off and do stuff. But it's the conscious thinking. Yes. That's the difference where you actually have to stop and work things out. I think it's pretty clear that they designed the game to be thought about. I mean, they gave us all that time in between turns, and we've got to do something with it. Yeah. I keep going on the assumption that you need to do well, but most people, if you play the game and you're just messing around, you don't necessarily need to do well. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people play Civ to really get immersed in it or to relax rather than to win or pick the optimal strategy. Yeah, I think so, too. It's hard for me to picture that because it's so different from how I approach any game, but I, I do believe you're right. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> you're some people say cool. that, and I, I assume they're not all lying. So they must be actually playing it with a different mindset. <laughs> well, even if you're not trying to play optimally and you're playing at a difficulty level that's approximately equal to what you're good at, at least if you're just playing, then you will have to stop and think sometimes because situations change. Yeah, that's true. Say Jim Wu has asked, I've bought everything that has been released for Civ 5 and I wasn't happy seeing totally unrelated content being advertised on the options screen of my game. Is anyone else miffed by this? So there was the Ace Patrol ad in the main menu of um, Civ 5. I didn't actually see it because I didn't load Civ while it was there, but apparently it was there. Apparently it was fairly unobtrusive, but people are complaining about it anyway. It was there. Meh. Get over it. You push mm. one button and you don't see it anymore. Yeah. Like, I you know, when right. you're actually playing the game rather than sitting at the main menu. Yeah, that's where it could become problematic. If they start using up screen space during gameplay for advertisements, that could be problematic because the UI is already has some limitations. And if you're going to use that space, you should use it well. Menu screens, not so much. I mean, the areas on menu screens really don't serve much purpose other than their aesthetic in the first place. So I can see ads there, and that's probably... Although I, you know, I, I don't like that direction. It's reasonable as long as you don't host the gameplay, then you know you're not going to cause too many fires. It's not like it was for something crazy. It was for another Paraxis product. I mean, it's also by something of Sid's. His <laughs> name's on Civ, so obviously no. you're part of the target audience. They want that to go to. It's it's not like they were advertising XCOM to the Civ people, which would be kind of eh. No, you know? not really. All you have to do is what every other marketing online thing does and profile people's tendencies. And then mm -hmm. when people do certain things, you send them certain kinds of ads mm -hmm. based on your prediction of what kind of person they are. Yeah, you've gone ahead and you've purchased a product that is a 2K product. And they're advertising another 2K product. And it's not just any other 2K product. As is pointed out, it's another title by Sid Meier. And I realize, yes, it's on the main screen of the game. I realize it's not like you're on Steam's homepage or something, and it's like there's a little ad that says, hey, you've purchased this. You might also be interested in this, but it's not obtrusive. Yeah. I get some people saying it would be nice to click a button to say, like, dismiss this ad or whatever or minimize it, but it is just on the main screen. There is a connection to how you're receiving it. And there's one person in the thread on uh, 2K, Deerhound. This is like driving a new car out of a yard, turning on the radio and having the radio play a tune singing, now you are in your new Ford, turn around, go back to the yard and buy Ford wheel rims. No. And then every time you get to turn on the radio, you get new advertisements. Well, yeah, it's been pointed out that you have purchased 
a Ford. So since you have a Ford, you've already engaged with this company. It's like, okay, you've already purchased a 2K product. Here's another 2K product. Click it or don't click it. And it's just like the DLC. Get it or don't get it. It's not like the big thing that pops up in your face every time. It was this tiny little thing that was the same width as the menu thing. It's going to disappear the minute you click an option to go load your game or something. You're going to see it for approximately 30 seconds when you load into the game. Ooh. Yeah, not really a big thing. I think it's a fairly smart marketing strategy, really, for two reasons. Firstly, Civ Five players are always complaining about air combat, and here they've made a game for them. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And, like, secondly, they've managed to get a mention on Polycast, so it's reaching out to all our millions of listeners. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) I still haven't figured out how to get that small image to appear on people's real-life field of view. Oh, right. My bad. <laughs> I know it was. I was kind of playing into it. Why are we whispering on a podcast? Because <laughs> it sounds hot. No. Dude, you don't have to ask that. You know the answer to that, Mackie. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think this person wants their <laughs> letter read in a whisper. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of our listeners want that either. He really compared us to different eras. <laughs> well, that was the challenge in episode 186. This person said that we were in the industrial era, and I asked that he go ahead and this person, I, I'm assuming it's a he, that he go through our archive and tell us when did we transition from era to era, and he in fact did that. And then some. <laughs> well, we'll get to the and then some, we'll get to that. <laughs> So, yeah, Candace Albinus decided, you know, Dan gave him a challenge, and he's like, okay, here, here's your history of podcasts in comparison to that of the Western world. We technically skipped the ancient era, apparently. <laughs> Although he says Dan's old ACS radio thing was sort of that. Mm-hmm. you got to be really old to have that. <laughs> Internet Dan. Old. That's some thorough <laughs> research, I've got to say. That's, that's some thorough research. A Bolton Civilization site radio. Wow. Well, I see. The classical era was season one. Most of our long enduring presents were set, including their segment types, our current jokes like Chinese girls playing Civ. <laughs> Similar to the great traditions established during the classical era in history when governments and institutions were first developed in Rome and Greece. Although the first season was experimental in some ways, it provided the base from which the podcast later flourished. I know, but Rome and Greece eventually fell. Uh... <laughs> let, let's stick to the glass being half full, Mickey. Okay. <laughs> Let's see, he contends that the medieval era of polycasts began at the beginning of Season 2, based on a few events which occurred then and somewhat thereafter. Ah, so this time the episodes are sorted into three-fourths of their former length. Yeah, Dan got tired of editing an entire long, 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 long thing. Is like, guys, can you shut up a little more, you know? Whoa, 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 I'm Canadian. I would never say <laughs> shut up except for quoting you right now. But anyway. <laughs> and then just randomly deleting you anyways. Yeah, probably. There's nothing random about... I mean, no, continue. <laughs> some of the older members of the show disappeared to transfer to other projects, and for some time there's a period of instability, mirroring that of the post-imperial centuries in Western Europe. Hey, there's the fall thing. Stability did return after some time, and from there the podcast made continual progress forward. Let's see, the medieval era gets to subdivided based into a few different sections. Let's see, from season two up to episode 68, it's kind of... Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, there he's talking about when we had uh, K-Mad Candy as a replacement for Locutus, one of the original four co-hosts who went over to Modcast, and then she became unavailable, and we just had a, a several months of just rotating guest co-hosts more than usual, until eventually Cardamandua came on board about half a year later. Oh, yes, and then the great separation of us from Bolton, because, well, <laughs> stuff happened. Yeah. So then we get into sort of a high Middle Ages where we're getting more restored sense of order and increasingly more nuanced statements regarding the games. It's because at that point we were into all the little fine details of the game because there was no new content or anything else. So you have to go everything with a fine tooth comb. And this is the point where I was starting to wonder, are we actually going to run out of crap to talk about? Because <laughs> I'm thinking we're getting, it's getting a little thin in here, guys. And then they had up to five. Well, there we go. <laughs> Well, yeah, and we actually revisited some topics. It's like, okay, uh, we talked about this before. Beyond the Sword. Yes. This period lasted until. Until, yeah, until we, all of a sudden, <gasps> it's a five time. 
Oh, yes. Then we had our 100th episode where we got people on. And it was the first time we did something live. And that's the start of the Renaissance. The Renaissance? Renaissance? (laughs) 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 Ah, yes. I'm waiting for that. (laughs) Awesome. Yes, Mark by transition from the pre-recorded to the live and getting to the five. And mailbag became the open mic segment, like what we're doing right now. Well, we get mail, but it's not so often, you know. You can send more mail if you want. <laughs> you can send it to me privately. No, continue. Send all hate mail, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, new traditions. We got more turbulence among our subject matter because the first part of Civ 5 was a little rocky start. It wasn't yep. bad. <laughs> well, it had its moments. Let's do Glass is <laughs> full, right? <laughs> <laughs> I like the uh, as a result sentence from me. Yes, as a result, it's very displayed in a blend between Civ 4 and Civ 5, with Civ 4 being favored in a similar respect as the established ways in Europe when the new ideas of liberty, humanism, science, and artistry began to reemerge. So, what? To Civ 4, the new artist? <laughs> I'm confused. He's trying to go for the transition of uh, yeah. ideals from, you know, and comparing Civ 4 to old ideals. Ah. Uh. And remember, this is all tying back to comparing polycast history to that of the Western world. Yes. So it's, I was like, wow, that's, uh, I had not thought of that before in that way. I feel more important than I probably should, but I'm fine with that. So by after all of this, the current area of polycast is industrial, which started with the release of Gods and Kings and Madgen coming on. Yes, and then going into the industrial era, we leave Civ 4 behind because when's the last time anyone booted up Civ 4 around here? Um, technically speaking, I did a couple days ago to test my wine installation in Linux to see if it would work, and it didn't, so I need to, like, patch things up with a lot of my games. I, it was before Gods and Kings came out. Yeah, I think I almost clicked on it by accident a couple times when we were starting a regular Saturday games, because they're right next to each other on the list. It's like, oops, no, wrong Civ. <laughs> see, Civ 4 is now the wrong Civ. <laughs> oh, man, Maggie said it. Oh, man. Send all hate mail, too. I was going to pounce on the wording, and then I thought I'd see if either Phil or Madgen would instead, and I got what I wanted. <sighs> They're just waiting to attack me. <sighs> you set yourself up. You are the only woman on the internet, so everything you say is closely scrutinized. Indeed. <laughs> Speaking of <laughs> jokes and new jokes, and new jokes getting old, oh, yeah, yeah. But considering he says in here that he hasn't written an essay in 10 years, that's quite an essay, actually. No, no, that's not quite an essay. (laughs) (laughs) That's just an email. That was the appetizer to the main course. Short essay. Sheesh. (laughs) So when do we get to the postmodern era? We need some POMO. We haven't seen the atomic era yet. Well, clearly for us to get to the atomic era, Phil still has to be around. (sighs) Do we have to research the internet before (laughs) we put this on? (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry, I will get you guys there. If I accomplish nothing else, it is important. Canis uh, Albanese went for some extra credit. He says, P.S., a few months ago, I went on a vacation across the United States with my family, during which I had over 20 hours of free time with no internet. Ooh! I mean, what? As I, I'm a hobbyist uh, creative writer, I pulled out a book of writing prompts. The prompt told me to do the following, quote, choose a television, radio, movie, or book series with a significant number of characters or personalities. Use these personalities and personify them in the form of deities akin to those of classical mythology from Greece or Rome and write a brief synopsis of a story using them and the world they uh, inhabit, unquote. Now, when I read this, and I'm like, I guess the closest series we are is radio, and I know there's some podcasters out there, and I've said recently on the show that would go... I call it radio! But anyway, at the time, I was listening to one of the earlier Polycast MP3s and decided to use that. So 20 hours later, I had written an eight-page poem in the style of the Epic of Gilgamesh about the first season of Polycast. I have included it with this email, knowing how ridiculous it is, but also knowing how ridiculous you are. Yes! I thought you might find it humorous. I just found the second last sentence humorous, to be quite honest. So we present to you, not rehearsed, by the way. Nope. That would not be a polycast tradition. The lay of the polycast, Canto 1. In the beginning, there was the computer, and from it, there came the internet.
In the days of its infancy, the Great One, whose name stands alone above many, created the first world in all its wonder. There later came the second world, born from the first with the help of his second, who later left to build on a new planet. Of the third world, we say little, as it was unfriendly and loathsome. He arrived the new one, the builder of many dreams, with whose assistance the much-beloved and forever immortalized fourth world in slowly blooming form was revealed. These events I do not relate now, as they are for another tale. Here espoused is a story below, that of the greatest ones, a yarn of those who loved the worlds and how they responded to them. As the people experienced the world one at a time, and often in sequence, areas of the internet began to form and coalesce around the ideas they held to their hearts so tightly. One now we may reveal, as some may remember, the glorious and untamable Greek mount. The people from all cultures found acceptance among those at the mount, and as time went by, more and more arrived to join the common people of the worlds. But as the Greek mount saw the release of the great fourth world, and perhaps even before, the peoples felt their grasp of the others wane and die. More and more of the people lost track of the business waged upon the mount. Others wanted more to see, more to hear, more to read, more to enjoy. And seeing this, the gods of the Greek mount, those who sought to make peace between the wild and the calm, grieved at the happenings they saw before them. As they watched, the lights brought by the people, where the care of the worlds began to flicker and darken. Lest the light be lost, or the chaos of the areas without return, one of the gods, the one called Danku, the god of love and the chief of those at the mount, whose passion for the worlds and people was the greatest among the gods, sought a solution to the impending darkness, one for the people to rekindle the light and bring love to the worlds back to those who had forgotten why they had come in the first place. At first, Dan Cube attempted to create this without the aid of others. He began to recite in the darkness a song about the worlds as they grew. The song is named Ascor, Song of the Early Days, and much of the Greek mount cares little for the sounds and words therein. It is no use, said some people to each other. We can read it all for ourselves on the mount. Why should we listen to this little song, whose melody is flat, without life, and full of monotony? Such talk did little to dissuade the god Dan Q, <laughs> and, seeking to give the people of the worlds the content they sought, he devised another of his ambitious plans. A new melody he conceived in his heart and mind, one full of life and rich is difference. A song whose worldly form was a light of piercing brightness but subtle edges. The light would be a reflection of unity and strengthened by the diversity of the mind, a mirror and prism to gather those flames in the hearts of the people of the worlds which alone had been so prone to die. It is not known where Dan Q's inspiration for this great ideal had come, but likely much of it was born from his days at the forefront of the Greek mount. Dan Q gathered unto himself some others with whom he might prevail and remove to the highest part of the Greek mount. These other gods, of whom there were three, with them brought all the tools needed to fulfill his goal. The first follower, the god of order, was the one called Loki, also well known for his status as the Prawn King. His shield bore the likeness of the Rod of the Master, and it was his task to maintain the safety of the people. Also among them was the goddess of the heavens, who we call Mackie. She carried the standards across the sky in the earlier days, and upon her summons by the god Dan Q, she set upon the sky the great lone star, by which in future times, time was often reckoned. The final god to answer the summons was the god of the underlands, Imrath the Joker. Upon his flag was emblazed a flame, a standing reminder of his earliest days. His duty was that of cleanup and clearing when people's thoughts turned from the world to those other things the minds of men might contrive to assail their fellows in jest or anger. When the four of them were together assembled, Dan Q exposed his ideas and plans, saying, Let us build a place for ideas to exchange. 
more than just through uncontrolled meetings and wild meanderings of unnumbered people. With our skill and our effort we can bring the many, the conflicting ideas together in peace. Let us preserve their dim lights for future to see, lest all our knowledge to those who follow us be lost in the dark. We must bring a constant light across the land, both on the Greek Mount as well as that beyond it. Come with me, there is much work to be done. With labor, time, and uncounted face palms, they erected a grand glowing tower whose foundations were wrought from the minerals of the world. Marble and stone were for the facades, iron and coal for fashioning steel to hold up the great tower they built, oil for plastics and fuel, and aluminum for all that needed to stand tall. The base they built from the stones taken from the walls of the cities in the worlds they had conquered. Bricks from China, from Germany, and even from Zululand were placed, with great care in subtle arrangements. Art from the worlds was mounted inside, with sculptures from Milan, carvings from Onondaga, oils from Paris, and pots from Hattusa, all present from the worlds they built. Kindness the Great Ones granted upon them, and gifted some melodies for their use in the construction in the light. Weapons they had, but few, as they never conceived of any need to attack the people they sought to save. But there were a few great claymores from Celtia, brutal scimitars from Turkey, and fabled bows of England, in safety stored in a hidden place, ready for the inevitable Aztec Jaguar raid. They collected great writings in a library, full of the knowledge from multiple worlds. The secrets of the stirrup, the keel, satellites, fiber optics, and steel, together held for use in their endeavor. With great care, they crafted a chamber, opulent with crafted wood from all lands and adorned with gold, silver, and gemstones. In this chamber were arrayed a collection of many chairs for the people of the worlds who in times of discussion gathered there with the chance to opine on strategies which might be most effective. This room they called the Senate, where great ideas would be weighed out. Below the Senate, in a smaller, duller room, they designed a receiver for the people of the worlds to send them the ideas over which many had worked and sometimes fought. There were many screens and computers therein with which they communicated with the people below them on the Greek Mount. Another of the tower's inside chambers, the one with the thickest walls and the most stable air, they designed to test new ideas, seeking new ways the worlds might be improved. Their vision was a place where in the confines of their room, they might imagine how the worlds as they stood would change if the rules of the worlds were changed. Atop the tower, they constructed a metal beacon, a communication system to put all others to shame. This was the greatest of the early works of Dan Hugh. The efforts he puts into the forming of this device finds its match but rarely in the annals of the worlds. When all this was finished and the tower complete, the gods came together and began to speak. For an untold time they talked to each other of the many things and wonders they had seen in the worlds. They told of their losses, their victories, their successes, their failures, and most of all, they spoke of the worlds, of its joys and sorrows, of its polish and blemish, and of the reason they all came together at the Greek Mount in the beginning. These words were gathered together in the library, combined and ordered for the betterment of the message. They arrived the fateful day, the time when their work might see some life, and from atop the tower where the array they had built, the bright light burst forth across the darkening land, feeble at first, though always growing and strengthening, with not to restrain it but time. Many others laughed at them for their deeds atop the mound, preferring the lesser lights they carried with them. Some called it foolish, a thing filled with too much humor at the expense of the serious business their own discussions required. And yet the weeks passed, the light in the sky ever chasing away the shadows. When the third great movement of the fourth world was revealed, the four of them were there to lead their people into the glorious lands beyond the overt weapons of the earlier days. They railed against those odd people who chose to play with the start past the origin. They derided those among them who played the dreaded small game boxes. Dan Q reveled in the glory of the shinies, and in his time. In time, the light pervaded the shadows about the Greek Mount, as the seasons of the year passed ever towards the autumn. The gods were given audience with some of the great ones, those who had in their time created the worlds we love. The details of the creations, as much as they might be revealed to those below, with care were given to the people for the light of the Mount. Throughout the times here before described, 
Those around the Greek mount sought out for those who might be different, more akin to Mackie, of whose kind there remained few. For many months, stories were told of the mythical female people of the worlds, how they might not even exist beyond the goddess of the heavens, or how they could be of different ways, or maybe perhaps they simply preferred to stay in other places whose focus was also the worlds. For all the year, the gods did search, sometimes in humor but also in earnest, in hopes of finding the fabled girls of the worlds. As Denku reflected upon the light and its successes, he struggled with doubts about the handling of the altering. Those who altered the worlds existed, and the Greek mount but of their gods. Only Loku knew any about their labor. Between Denku and Loku arose a new plan, which promised to help those alterers of the worlds. Loku went down to the commons of the Greek mount, and there recruited three alterers with such wisdom to understand the needs of those people. He brought them up to the tower atop the mount, and for them constructed a special place which they might use to enhance the light. While these plans were in motion, another came to its end. Three girls of the world were found at the mount, and with some discussion they agreed to come to the tower and speak. The first was the goddess of sweets, Kaimad, whose marshmallow standard was a very recognizable character and color. The second, the goddess of pachyderms, Kati rode upon a war elephant of glorious strength, carrying a standard of a deep auburn red and blazoned with a golden brace of thistle. The final was not of gods, but her level of experience few could match. She was Nola, and on her standard was a white and black bird of prey. That day, at the end of the year, many new people came together and in joy acknowledged the light. Some of the guys from Paraxis and some guys from Microsoft have put it together a new studio called Oxide. They are going to be making a next-gen 3D engine for console and PC gaming. It's called Nitrous. Oh, I guess we want the other kind of stuff, like racing stuff, I see. It's just a long press release, but we're doing this thing, we're doing this, and we're going to have all this, and blah, 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 blah. It's technical. It would make more sense if I was a programmer, I'm sure. But the number of developers that are already committed to using it, Stardock's going to use it. There's only Stardock is listed. What? <laughs> uh, maybe Stardock's going to try and use it for uh, Gale Civ 3. Possibly. They did say it was going to be a 64-bit game, what, didn't they? Yeah, that's the other thing. They're doing 64-bit with that. Stardock apparently did also provide some of the seed capital for Oxide, so they also have a little investment there. Mm-hmm. And then Mohawk Games is also going to use this Nitrous game engine for their title, which is presently named, codenamed Mars, but Soren Johnson has said one of the founders of that studio, that they are looking for a more permanent title for legal purposes. <laughs> Go figure. No, like, honestly, at first, when I read it with Codenamed Mars in the quotation marks, I thought, oh, we're used to projects having, like, code names. And I think about the different versions of the Microsoft operating system when we learn about their code name. I thought the name of it was actually Codenamed Mars. And then I read that that's just a placeholder. I was a little sad, but I understand. <sighs> just a placeholder for a gold code name. Uh, but... This is good news, though. If uh, developers that aren't necessarily going to build a game get around to switching things over to 64-bit native rather than just, you know, converted, then we're going to start having better quality games, or at least quality in the respect that they might actually work on Windows and other such systems that have 64 bits rather than being crashy and clunky because they're still trying to support the 32-bit stuff. And we might have something more than DirectX 9. <laughs> Doesn't every system, operating system in existence, at least have some capability of uh, 64-bit these days, like the ones that are actually being released? Depends on how old your computer is, but mostly. Anything made in the past couple of years, if you have like an up-to-date operating system, you should probably be able to... Nah, Windows is still being sold in 32-bit. Yeah. For absolutely no reason. Like, it, this is more dip it down to your CPU. Once CPUs stop being 32-bit and they just full flip to 64-bit, then not going to be much of a choice for anybody. I see. So that's, so that's the limiting factor. Uh, well, it's not really limiting, but it's well, more for of, a full switch. 
Yeah, the force flip will happen once your whole PC stops supporting 32-bit because it's old. What's that, buy a new computer already? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I've been meaning to, actually. Well, there you go. This thing's like five years old now, so, you know. I'm slowly replacing my pieces, but I think I need to replace the motherboard and CPU and stuff. Well, I'm not going to junk this one. It still has a lot of good function. I just, you know, get a new one for gaming and put this one somewhere else. Might be a server. <laughs> Maybe. Speaking of someone who is more than five years old and also has more functions, Stardock CEO Brad Wardell is... Um, <laughs> I was trying to bring us back to the... I tried. I tried. <laughs> As Mackie mentioned, Galactic Civilizations 3 was announced by Stardock in mid-October, and then Brad Wardell is part of Oxide Games and then is serving as studio president on Mohawk Games. This nitrous game engine is going to be used by Mohawk Games for their first title. And the particular point that actually came up in the uh, Game Informer article was Soren Johnson saying who's the chief executive officer of Mohawk Games, noting that the Nitrous Oxide is a game engine specifically built for strategy games as opposed to, say, 3D engines that have been used in the past. If you think about Civilization IV, there is the Gamebryo engine. But that was initially designed for in like a first or third person shooter. And so they're not going to have to try to misuse the engine, quote unquote, as Soren was saying, to try to, you know, adapt it for, you know, a strategy game, which is, is I think that was the comment that I appreciated the most out of all of this. And the only thing, and I, I'm... <sighs> I'm not going to make this politicast. The only thing I'm going to say is Mohawk Games. Really? Mohawk Games? Uh, I don't think much of the title of that company. I'm going to say that. But What? How does that politicast? It's just the title. You know, we, we can move on. Because it's the name of a Native American tribe, perhaps? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, but it's also the name of a hairstyle. And if yeah. Just... yeah, I know, but that doesn't mean that we should perpetuate it. I know. I know what you're saying, but... Uh, I, I can look past it. I will... Let's I'm sure they had they some sort of, of discussion about why to call it Mohawk. How high can your city-states go? In influence. Influence. Going to influence your Mohawk? Um, convince it to go? Arizona Gamer on, again, Reddit. Why am I getting the Reddit ones? Wow, what's the highest you've gotten city-state influence to on an individual uh, city-state? Apparently, he's been able to get, or she, whichever, betting it's a he, managed to get uh, their influence up to 4,341. It's very plausibly doctored, but they may have actually used gunboat diplomacy. Basically, they sat back and just kind of let it go. And other people talked about 1,000 is pretty high, blah, blah, blah. The highest they've ever normally gotten is about 350-ish to 400. So I guess the question comes down to, is it a marathon game where you still get your every three turns in marathon or nine turns or something is worth like one standard? If so, divide. And even still, it's pretty high. So they must have got it really early and then just never let the game end. Well, I suppose you could feed them a crap ton of cash to get that high. No, no, um... I'll actually reference the thread because we probably won't cover it ever else by a big Civ fan. He talking about combining basically freedom, mercenary army with land necks and uh, the <laughs> big band plus mercantilism and just getting a ton of land necks and using those for influence. <laughs> mm. Always possible. If you just gouged one city state that way, I'm sure you could get a ton, especially on marathon. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. I have to assume it's Marathon or something, because they said Venice plus Gunboat Diplomacy plus Patronage. And it's really got to be a time-based victory. Like, the game was over a long time ago. Yeah. Sort of thing. Because, yeah, seriously. If you're over, like, three, 400, you're probably sufficiently high enough <laughs> at that point. Yeah. And if Gunboat Diplomacy <laughs> is actually working, it must be on some lower difficulty level. Yeah, I was wondering about the difficulty level, too. You said yeah. you tinker around trying to get all your cities up to 50 or something crazy. Well, I mean, it's got to be somewhat lower for gun diplomacy to actually work because the AI has to be not at the higher level so that they won't build as many units. Yeah, one free internet cookie for anyone who can figure out what it is from the screenshot that we haven't talked about yet, but that, of course, I'm going to mention. Uh, this is this a selfie? They recognize your military strength will give in to tribute demand. One free internet cookie for Mackie. I mean, seriously, this person hasn't clicked that button yet. I can see in the background the only quest that that city straight has is to complete a trade route with them. Forget it. Get much more gold more quickly by demanding tribute right now. You are fail, sir. Especially at four grand. You can do that for a long time. Before it, yeah. 
Yeah, that's one nice thing about gun diplomacy. Once they're scared of you, you get all the influence, and then you can just randomly uh, ask for tribute, and then it'll go down, but then it'll go back up because they're still scared of you. That, and if you really wanted to, you could actually bully them for gold, like I've said several times on this show, and then give them gold back, and you have even more influence now because they like it. They like it, dirty. Silly mechanic. Anyway. Um. The Geek Fights podcast over at geekfights.net provides quote-unquote intelligent discussion of inane topics. Here's regular co-host Mike Ortiz describing the format of their show from its 36th episode released in February 2011. We have an NCAA tournament-style bracket. We pit uh, two competitors against one another and put it to a vote. Majority wins. The panel can decide the battle any way they see fit. Just use your geek logic. Jason Mega Bears fan Greed, guests on episode 140 and 175 of Polycast, also appeared on five episodes of the Geek Fights podcast that concluded its run this past October. Episode 142 of Geek Fights was on Video Game Character Showdown. Here's the show's lead co-host, Damian Shaw. We're on to our next fight. Jason, this one is yours. It is Qbert from Qbert versus Gandhi from Civilization. Gandhi has nukes and he's not afraid to use them. Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Gandhi actually scares the crap out of me whenever I play Civilization, so definitely Gandhi. Josh? Um, yeah, I mean, Gandhi is kind of shitty as a as a tactician, but I mean, if you if you want to beat Gandhi as Qbert, here's what you do. You, you fucking build up your sciences, and then you just fucking, you Qbert the shit out of him, whatever that means. Oh, vote for Qbert. Uh... As far as I know, even though I have played uh, several rounds of uh, Civilization, Gandhi is still technically a uh, pacifist. <laughs> no, not in... Not in uh, I know, I know, I know, I know. He's, he's, he's the exact opposite of a pacifist in Civilization. Yeah, this isn't Gandhi in real life. This is Gandhi from Civilization. W- which, is, which is a horrible war- warmonger. But Qbert uh, can jump up the, those, those, those pyramids, and that's what he's going to do. He's going to jump up a pyramid. And uh, tie it up and send it to Chris Mitchell. Who takes the win? The first thing that I do whenever I start a new game on civil or get a new civilization game is I choose to be Gandhi and I blow shit up. And that's exactly what Gandhi would do in this fight. He would tool himself up while Cuba's busy going up and down in like diagonals up and down the pyramid and stuff like that. Gandhi's leveling everything up. He's building everything he can. He's getting them nukes and he's dropping them on Cuba's head. Gandhi. Leave it to the British guy, that British guilt for what they did to the Indian folk. He's just mad because Gandhi beat him in real life. Oh, Gandhi. Sorry. Takes the win. We are on to our next fight. Josh, this one is yours. Ooh, it's a hard one for you. It's Gandhi versus Duke Nukem. I don't know if that's a hard one for me because Duke Nukem has one rule. Always bet on Duke. Gandhi may have nukes, but if you played forever, you know Duke survives a nuke. Because he ain't fucking around. Gandhi's going to be like, oh, I killed him. And then Duke's going to say, guess again. And he's going to freeze him, fucking shatter his ass. No, even better. Gandhi's going to be chilling out on the teleporter pad. Duke Nukem jumps on there, telefrags him, and he gets blown to bits as Duke's covered in Gandhi guts. Oh, hell yes. Now that's a fanfic I'm ready to play. I don't think Teleporter Pad has ever been a technology in Civilization. Who gives a shit? <laughs> it's real in Duke, and we're crossing it up. Fucking, you know Gandhi would get that shit if it was there, so he could rule over all his little city-states that he runs. He'd say, give me the Teleporter Pad. Give me the Teleporter Pad. And then Duke would say, damn, I'm good. I'll vote for it, Duke Nukem. Blow it out your ass. Uh... But Gandhi is in I'm talking about the uh, real Gandhi. And he liked to have Yeah. So I'm talking real Gandhi. You can't talk real Gandhi. We're talking about Siv Gandhi. Yeah, but... Gandhi. Just... Siv Gandhi can also sometimes be racist. <laughs> okay. Okay, is... okay then. Maybe Siv Gandhi. But um, Duke Nukem uh, can be the guy who like chose not to eat for quite a while. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with uh, Duke Nukem. Uh, Chris. Always said on Duke. Uh, Gandhi, he could easily beat Hubert. Um, 
but I, I think that, that Duke's speed, his maneuverability, and the fact that he doesn't have to wait and push enter to wait to the end of the turn before he can attack Gandhi, probably get him the win. Gandhi will always be limited by the, by the fact that you have to wait at the end of your turn. Uh, so Duke takes the win. A vote for Duke Nukem. Jason. No, you, you, you guys are totally wrong, because this is the way that Gandhi works. Gandhi likes to play the pacifist thing for, like, most of the game until he invents nukes. So what Gandhi does is Gandhi just starts playing off the fact that Duke Nukem is a total warmonger and then gets all of the nations of the world to think that Duke Nukem is a warmonger so that they all go to war against Duke Nukem. And Duke Nukem's not going to fight off the armies of the entire world. And then, you know, when he's beaten and broken and battered, then Gandhi just drops a nuke on him. Gandhi. A vote for Gandhi and Dan. Um, I'm pretty, pretty massive argument for Gandhi there. However, I don't think that's true. I uh, I think that if Gandhi had gone up against anyone but Qbert last round, I don't think he would have made it. So Duke Nukem. Duke Nukem. Forever moving on. Want to hear the uncensored and uncondensed versions of the arguments you've already heard from Jason and the other panelists? Visit geekfights.net to access. Please note that the show includes mature themes and explicit language. Call Call in today. today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. In Europe, 441212887659. That's 44 441- one two one two eight eight Polly. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. For more information on Polycast, our sibling shows Modcast, Revcast, and Turncast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series official website at thepolycast.net. Oh, all right. Well, that was that, and this was this. Oh, indeed. I am apparently doing the closing, so I will. Thank you all for joining us for Polycast episode 187. This is the me and team, and today I was joined by Dan Q. No more blah blah blah. Makalua. You promise? Majin. Yada yada yada. And guest co-host Kamikaze. Is my microphone still blasting your ears? No, it's behaving at the moment. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Time to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always next time. This is your Bert Mackey. Mackey! <laughs> Mackey? Oh no! <laughs> Get the mute button, okay? <laughs> uh, Maki just wanted to emphasize how we had not rehearsed this before. She just wanted me to sound truthful. Thank you, Maki. Uh, you want to read the whole thing? Come on, Maki, you can do it. We're doing it. We've only got an hour, so you know, hurry up. <laughs> just for that, I'm going back on mute. Drink some caffeine and uh, do this. Just stuff. do it. Inject it into your veins. Go, go, go. Where'd you go? Did you really go back on mute? <laughs> oh, Mackie. It's only 277 words. That's not even a single page, single spaced. Come on. It's not even close. It's like half. Can you give me a minute to stop laughing? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I'd be willing to give you a minute, Mac, if we could at least hear you laughing. Then I'd have some blooper material. <laughs> Whoa, static. Whoa, static, indeed. Oh, that, that's from you, uh, kid. Ooh, sorry. I know that's not part of the, uh... <laughs> that's not part of the poem. <laughs> Isn't that the bit about the beacon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't worry. There will be some post-production, shall we say. Yeah, I hope yeah. so. And by post-production, Dan means the entire thing is going to be read off in auto-tune to each of our voices. <laughs> oh, my God. No auto-tune. <laughs> Don't worry, Canis. I will not do that. I am not Phil. <laughs> Come on. Even I wouldn't do that to our listeners. I, I like having listeners. Um, and potentially other stuff. Yep. 
Somebody was driving. And somebody is furiously typing in the background. It's not furiously. Good God, it's just that. Down to earth. Is, isn't it? <laughs> yes, Mackie is writing hate mail to this person right now. <laughs> Recorded November 16th, 2013. Geek Fights clips copyright Mike Ortiz. Civilization 3 clip copyright Infograms. Civilization 4 and 5 sound clips copyright Take-Two Interactive. Copyright Civilized Communication at civcom.net.